share screen. Okay, now we're ready. So these first three weeks, you, you get to listen to me quite a bit, which is, I don't know, good, bad, or indifferent, but uh, normally, uh, really starting next week, you're going to be doing a lot more kind of hands-on, looking at bones and muscles, and then it, we'll be dissecting brains and hearts. And so you'll be doing a lot more typically, you know, again, with a hybrid course, all of the lecture materials generally online. And then when we get together, we do a little bit of lab and, you know, for a couple of hours. So, but again, these first couple of weeks of labs are better done, I think, virtually. Normally, or not, you know, with visible body, I suppose, or I guess that's kind of virtual. Um, so today we're going to look at tissues and skin. With, with visible body. And normally uh, tissues are done, um, we look, use microscopes, so which we do have. Um, and I think, uh, you know, as the semester goes on, uh, I'll get the microscopes out to, if anybody would like to look at them. Uh, I guess it kind of depends on what your level of comfort is and the level of more or less level of interest more than anything. Students generally aren't very, yeah, cells and tissues are kind of at the back end of, of what most students are interested in. So I, I don't force microscopes on students anymore. <laughs> it's been probably six or seven years, you know, after 10, 12 years of this is what you do, this is what you do, the microscopes, they, they, I found that students don't generally don't get much out of them as a collective. Now, individually, some students, like I say, they, they don't mind, they like it, they in fact want to, because they're maybe going into being some like a lab technician or something. So they'll be using microscopes maybe more often than, than others. So that option is always available moving, up, moving forward every Tuesday when we're together. Again, I'm not, it's not required, but today is a prime example of when we would be using microscopes. But with the wonders of technology, we get to see uh, some e excellent tissue slides together as a group. And in essence, what you would see if you were looking under a microscope. So uh, we're gonna look at different tissue types. We'll classify tissue um, and then move into skin, uh, our first body system. Now that also concludes uh, well, not today, it's kind of the, the beginning of the end of uh, module one. So units one, two, and three uh, are, are going to be concluded today. And then uh, you want to work on or continue working on your first assignment, that packet that has uh, all of those definitions and, and labeling, which I think we went through. So anyhow, Moving forward, and again, you keep working on your visible body quizzes. If you haven't yet uh, finished your uh, lab safety quiz, you want to get that going too. I believe it's still open and available. All right, so we're going to go into visible body today and look at tissues. And again, tissues are the next level of organization. So as we look at tissues, we're, we're looking at a collection of cells. And the, the first tissue type that we really probably will spend the majority of the time uh, talking about tissues with epithelial, the first classification uh, is a, a dense collection uh, of cells. So when we, again, look at tissues, we're really looking at cells. Okay, so the four major tissue types uh, are epithelial. It's probably the, the, of the four, that's a term you probably maybe, you're probably least familiar with. Um, epi, we know, means upon something. E-P-I, that prefix, means upon something. 
epithelium. We're going to see that as a lining or a covering. Okay? So as we look at our organs and uh, organ systems moving forward, we're going to break down the structures on a micro scale. And the covering or the lining of the organ is going to be epithelial tissue in nature. Good morning. Okay, so epithelium is a lining or a covering. Again, we'll get more uh, into detail with epithelium as we go. Uh, connective tissue. So, so in essence, epithelium is going to be the most superficial of the tissues. Now, when we look at the surface of the body, we certainly see the skin, and that's the epidermis specifically, but it's epithelial tissue. Now, in inside the body or internally, we have a whole bunch of tubes, okay? the nasal cavity, the respiratory system, right? Digestive system, cardiovascular system, urinary system, reproductive system. It's a bunch of tubes, okay? hoses. And all of those tubes are gonna be lined with epithelial tissue. So epithelium provides some protection. We'll see that it can provide some secretive mucus or serous fluids. We have to keep a lot of these tubes somewhat hydrated. Don't want them to be dried out. Okay. So we'll see the epithelial cells. Some of them are responsible for producing mucus, producing some sort of fluid. All right. So epithelium, we'll look at that uh, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, just deep to epithelium, we're going to find connective tissue. Connective tissue uh, is going to be cells. We're going to see it as cells kind of floating around or suspended in some sort of medium. And that medium is called a matrix. So cells in a matrix is what connective tissue is. Okay. Cells in a matrix. Whereas epithelium, because it's a lining or covering, it's more there for protection. Cells are going to be densely compacted typically. So we don't really see, so it's cells on top of cells, next door to cells, there's cells galore with epithelium. With connective tissue, cells are a little more scattered around. Okay. All right, so connective tissue connects epithelium to underlying, more underlying tissue, which would be muscle typically. Okay? Muscle is the third type of tissue and muscle tissue comes in three forms. And we'll see, of course, muscles that you all have heard of before you ever came in here, your, your skeletal muscles, muscles that provide movement. Okay? And then of course, the cardiac muscle, the heart. And then all of those tubes I mentioned earlier, are gonna be comprised of smooth muscle, okay? We've seen this a little bit last week in cells, but uh, anyhow, muscle cells making up muscle tissue. And then the fourth tissue type is nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is ubiquitous or kind of spread all over the place. We find nervous tissue in muscle, all three muscle types. We find nervous tissue in all of the connective tissue types. We find nervous tissue plugging in or innervating epithelial tissue. In fact, epithelium is not only there for protection, but it's there as kind of a, a linkage to the nervous system. Helps with sensory perception, internal and external. Okay. All right, so let's keep going. There you go, epithelial. Uh, one example that, that we're very familiar with, of course, is the skin. At least one layer of the skin. Okay. The outermost layer, the epidermis. Okay. So we have epithelial sheets. So these are gonna be coverings, uh, for body structures, your linings, those internal tracts 
you've probably you've heard that term, right? Urinary tract or digestive tract. And again, it, it has a T, it's not track. It's not the urinary tract with a K, it's a tract with a T. It's basically a series of tubes. So the skin and those internal tracts are going to be covered or lined with epithelium. Those are sheets of, of cells. And then all of our glands you want to associate with being uh, epithelium in origin. And when we look at glands today, we're going to see that we have two different categories of glands, endocrine versus exocrine. So we'll look at that in more detail later. So there, when I click on internal tracks, we see all of these different tubes. You can see the respiratory tract, which starts in the nose and nasal cavity. It's down into the lungs. We see the digestive tract. And you can see the urinary tract. And for females the, and males, the reproductive tract, we're showing a uterus. Bladder and a uterus and a colon. So we've got three tubes that have exits and entrances, I suppose, to some degree. Okay. They don't really show it at all on here. And we don't really consider the cardio, like the blood vessels, they're not really considered tracks because they're not, there's not a beginning, like an opening end and then an, and then an end. Okay. The, the rest or the cardiovascular system is a closed system. So from heart out and back to the heart is just one closed system. However, those are tubes. Right, your blood vessels are tubes. They're not that much different than any other tube in the body. So they have a lining too. They have an epithelial lining. And then lastly, um, again, glands, we'll see multiple different types of glands in the body, endocrine and exocrine. This is showing uh, some endocrine glands as well as exocrine. So we'll look in more detail at those coming up. All right, so epithelium. So we're gonna stay on epithelial tissue for just a little bit. Um, when we organize epithelium or classify epithelium, we classify it based on how many layers and what are the shapes of the cells. So the how many layers is gonna come as either one layer or more than one layer. So there are really only two classifications for layer amounts or thickness. It's either simple or one layer, the cells, I, I mean, the cell uh, arrangement. Okay, so epithelium is classified based on how the cells are arranged and the types of cells. So if the cells are arranged in one layer, we call it simple epithelium. Simple, one layer. If it's more than one layer, we call it stratified. Okay, stratified. Strata means layer. So stratified just means multiple layers. You can see at the top, they have the two categories. And then what they do is they uh, classify them as cell shape. So the first little batch there, uh, we see the word squamous. Squamous. Squamous means flat or squashed. Squamous, flat or squashed. So simple squamous epithelium means one flat layer of cells. Probably not going to provide much in the way of protection. 
So we generally will find simple squamous if we're exchanging gases somewhere in the body. So your capillaries would be simple squamous. In fact, when we talk about blood vessels in a few weeks, there are veins, arteries, and capillaries. Now veins and arteries are just transferring blood all over the body. Capillaries are where we actually drop things off to the cells or we pick things up. This is the grocery delivery garbage pickup, okay? Capillaries do that. So in the lungs, we deliver blood that's low in oxygen, high in carbon dioxide. So we breathe in or pull in oxygen and put it into the lungs and get the oxygen into the bloodstream and the carbon dioxide out of the bloodstream. There are little air sacs in the lungs that are made up of simple squamous or lined with simple squamous epithelium. Okay, rapid gas exchange. All right, stratified epithelium is simply uh, mean stratified squamous epithelium means we have multiple layers of flat cells. This is going to be more conducive to protection. So we would see stratified squamous certainly with the epidermis of the skin. We see it in other uh, tracts throughout the body where we'd maybe find higher traffic. Stratified squamous epithelium cells tend to uh, go through mitosis rather quickly. Okay. So we see uh, a lot of new layers with stratified squamous epithelium. When we get to the skin, we'll look at the epidermis of the skin and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of the life cycle of a skin cell and and what happens to it once it gets to the top. We see it become uh, kind of hardened or keratinized. We'll look at that later. Okay, and then we have some cuboidal, cuboidal shapes, so kind of cube-shaped cells. By the way, uh, when we look at these illustrations, we can see at the bottom the deep layer, I should probably clarify that this, the, the top or the superior aspect would be the superficial aspect. These are the, all, this is the pile of squamous cells and this is just one flat layer. We see a lot of little kind of purplish, darker circles inside of the, all of these cells. Those represent the nuclei of each cell. So we can distinguish uh, a cell from our cells that have generally have one nucleus. Okay. We do have some cells that are multinucleated, but for the most part, when we see a kind of a purple blob, that's indicative of a nucleus. Okay. Now we also see kind of deep or underneath these layers of cells, there's a little bit of a darker line there. You can see it, you can really see it on these cuboidals, these columnars. That is the connection line. They call that the basement membrane. Okay, so the basement membrane is, is the, in essence, kind of the floor of the epithelium meeting the connective. Okay, so the basement membrane is in essence like a layer that brings or anchors really those epithelial cells and connects them with the connective tissue. Okay, you see that kind of purplish line there, darker line, that's the basement membrane. So we have a kind of a, a, a thicker sheath that enables these cells to attach to something and anchor themselves to the connective tissue. So the other thing about all of this epithelial tissue is it's avascular, meaning it doesn't really have any kind of blood supply. This, notice the cells are just densely compacted together. So we're not gonna, there's no way of really getting a blood supply in there. And that's good because 
where we have high traffic areas, we wouldn't want, you know, chewing on a potato chip or a tortilla chip and it kind of slices the side of your, your mouth or your cheek, you know, and then you start bleeding all over the place. That would be intense or just a little scrape, you know, you scratch your arm, you have an itch and you bleed all over the place because you, you know, so, so we don't really want a blood supply in that, that epithelium. So we generally then will see a highly vascularized region in the connective tissue. So all of the, so this bottom chunk that they show us in each of these illustrations, that's indicative of the connective tissue. Okay, so we have epithelium, densely compacted cells, and then a basement membrane, and then we get to the connective tissue. And again, that connective tissue is vascularized, has a blood supply. Okay. We have the primary nerve supplies also in that connective tissue. But anyhow, I just wanted to clear that up before we get too much further. Hey, cuboidal was the next shape. You can see the cells are cube shaped. We have simple cuboidal. And stratified cuboidal. Generally, you want to associate the glands of the body. So, I mentioned earlier that glands are also comprised of epithelium or lined with epithelium. Okay. It would be cuboidal cells that we would associate with glandular epithelium. Okay. And then the next batch are called columnar cells. Columnar cells are column shaped. Simple columnar, find this in the digestive system, find this in areas where we may be secreting some mucus. Stratified columnar, we don't really see that very often. In fact, when you look at it, it doesn't really look like stratified columnar. It looks like one layer of columns sitting on top of some cuboidal cells. It's in fact really what it is. Remember cuboidal cells have a lot to do with glands. Well, we also can put so a, a layer of columns on top of some of these cuboidal cells. And we end up with this little blob here. This is some sort of goblet cell, they call it. A goblet is kind of like a container of something. Yeah, like Harry Potter's and the Goblet of Fire is goblet, some sort of, you know, witch's brew, you know, maybe put in a goblet. But for us, when we see goblet cells, we, it would be some sort of mucus that's being produced and secreted. So this lining here may need uh, some lubrication. So we get goblet cells that will secrete mucus. We also see another type of columnar epithelium where we see more goblet cells. They call it pseudo-stratified columnar. Pseudo means, uh, in essence, it means fake or maybe more accurately appears to be but isn't. So pseudo appears to be but isn't stratified epithelium. So what we see are a couple little kind of almost like uh, pyramids kind of at the base uh, of the pseudo stratified epithelium. We also will find what are called cilia. Cilia are little hair like projections. I think we talked about them briefly last week when we did cells, but we do see typically on pseudo stratified columnar some tiny cilia. So it's oftentimes ciliated pseudo stratified columnar. And cilia, they just provide us with assistance when it comes to kind of filtering uh, and collecting uh, maybe some particulates that are airborne. So we oftentimes see the pseudo stratified columnar lining uh, the nasal cavity, the sinuses, 
uh, and aspects of the respiratory tract. The respiratory tract uh, is staying rather hydrated most of the time because of these goblet cells. Basically what your respiratory tract, especially your upper respiratory tract, why it's so important not to be a mouth breather, to be a nose breather, because your mouth is for eating and drinking. Your nose is for breathing, okay? The nasal cavity uh, is designed, the lining of it, as well as your sinuses, to do three things. Air is generally pretty dirty, so we need to filter it. You're full of ciliated epithelium in your upper respiratory tract. Your mouth does not have those. Your mouth is mucous membranes that are very smooth. So particulates have an easier time getting into your uh, lower respiratory tract if you're breathing in through the mouth, okay? The nasal, nose and sinuses, nasal cavity is there to get all those particulates. Air is also very dry for the most part. It depends where you live, but you know, indoor air is, is pretty dry. Uh, so these mucus, your goblet cells, they help with humidifying the air. Air generally is also cool, uh, relatively cool. The inside of the body is almost 100 degrees inside the lungs, those air sacs. So outside the air, you know, it's 70 degrees, right? breathe in through the nose, highly vascularized in that connective tissue, deep region of that area. So we can warm the air as well. Your nasal cavity uh, and sinuses are highly vascularized. Keeps, it's there to warm the air. Okay? So breathe in through your nose, Breathe in through your sinuses, get all of that air nice and cleaned and, and hydrated and warmed up before it ever reaches your lungs. All right, so that pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium. And then lastly, we have what's called transitional epithelium. Transitional epithelium, you wanna to relate to the bladder, primarily the urinary bladder. The lining gets thinner. You fill a balloon with water, the lining gets thinner, right? As the balloon blows up, the rubber gets thinner. Well, it looks like it's picking it up because the closed captions are showing up. So, got a Zoom notification that. Audio might be struggling. Oh, well, hopefully not. All right. So anyway, transitional epithelium changes its thickness depending on whether we're filling up the balloon or emptying the balloon. All right. So simple. Where do we find some of these simple epithelial tissues? Uh, again, we could see uh, the renal glomeruli. That's a mouthful. We mentioned, I mentioned the alveoli or the air sacs of the lungs. We're doing some sort of exchange at a capillary network. Now, the glomerulus, a glomerulus, is a capillary ball uh, of the kidneys. <clears throat> the, kidneys <clears throat> the kidneys do a lot of filtration of our plasma. So in order to filter plasma, we have to have a, a, a way to remove the plasma from the bloodstream. So again, we need to do this relatively quickly. It's going on continually in the body. Uh, so simple squamous, that type of epithelium is gonna be found where we need to have rapid exchange of gases or fluids. Okay. Capillaries are where we exchange things. So we oftentimes find these with, associated with capillary networks. Okay. And then in that same area, we're gonna have tubules. You can see the term tubule over here. A tubule means small tube. A tube is a tube. A tubule is a little tube. Okay. 
we'll see throughout the semester if it ends in an E-L-L-E -L -L -E or an I-O-L-E or a U-L-E. That's a, a, a suffix descriptor that kind of minimizes or shrinks whatever it's discussing. We'll see arterial, venule, tubule. All of these mean little whatever. The you know, venule is a little vein. Arterial is a little artery. All right, tubule, little tube. So as we collect urine in the tubular system uh, of the nephron, what we end up with is uh, a little bit thicker tubing okay, called a tubule, and that is going to be cuboidal, simple cuboidal. Okay, and then the small intestines, we're going to see simple columnars. Okay. Again, these help with uh, some brush border enzymes, help with secreting mucus. And then we looked at the pseudostratified columnar. You can see it's got the little hairs or cilia on the surface. The goblet cells, they show it in the trachea. It's, at, it's the whole, basically the whole upper respiratory tract. And then down into the lower respiratory tract, the trachea, into the bronchi and the bronchioles a little bit. So those are your simple epithelia. There are other locations, certainly, but just don't want to bog you down too much with tissues because, again, you know, throughout the semester, we start every body system discussing cell type and tissue type. So today we're going to do our first system here shortly, integumentary, and we'll be discussing uh, this cells of the epidermis and what tissue type it is and the cells of the dermis and what tissue type it is. So again, don't think at all that we're just doing this just to check it off and move on. We're doing this as just an introduction. It's a foundational uh, introduction. You know, it's, it's new, new terminology. It's kind of weird terminology. Right? Don't worry because you'll see it over and over and over. By the end of this semester, you'll know what pseudostratified epithelium is by like the back here and where it's located. You know, know just about everything, uh, the foundationally, with what each organ and it, the organ tissue and cells are going to look like. Again, stratified has to do with multi, more than one layer. Stratified squamous, uh, again, most common area we would see that is the epidermis of the skin. The stratified cuboidal, that's going to be glandular typically. Glandular epithelium. Stratified columnar. Again, we don't really see that. That's extremely rare. Uh, we see it in the male urethra. And then transitional, you always want to associate with the urinary bladder. Anything that distends, fills up and empties. All right, so those are the basics of epithelial tissue. Now, um, Again, when you're doing your lecture stuff, I've got the videos, the, the lecture video and PowerPoint or the, the Google Slides that go with this. It goes into a, maybe a little bit more detail uh, of, of epithelium. Uh, but anyway, you guys don't remember, remember to watch those, right? You guys are, are going to your Google Slides. And okay, so we're here. Tissues and integumentary. And then the video, of course, is going to be from the course YouTube channel. So make sure you're watching these because as you go through and
you're doing your you're uh, filling out your homework and you're doing your goodies. Right here. So beyond what we're doing today, if again you need more info, there's where you would find it. All right. So connective tissue is next. So epithelium is a covering or a lining generally considered to be avascular or without a blood supply. Uh, cells pretty much organized in a nice, neat fashion, densely compacted with one another. That's all epithelium. We get to connective and we're going a little bit deeper. Okay, we're, we're deep or underneath the epithelial tissue. Okay. And again, the idea here with connective tissue is that the cells are gonna be in some sort of matrix. They're suspended in a matrix. They're not densely compacted. So we're gonna have some negative space. Okay, that negative space is considered to be the matrix. The matrix is composed of um, kind of like a, a liquid, calls it amorphous ground substance. So in essence, what that means is we've got kind of a, a fluid that uh, is going to have some electrolytes floating around in it. So sodium primarily, maybe some chloride ions, little tiny bit of potassium. And that's what that uh, amorphous ground substance. Okay. Almost like a gel. It's like a gelatinous kind of fluid that the cells float around in. And then we also find protein fibers making up that matrix. That comes into play with one of the one of the connective tissue types when we discuss the organization of those protein fibers. I'm sure all of you have heard of collagen at some point, maybe collagen, C O L L A G E N. Collagen fibers are protein fibers that provide some strength and durability to the connective tissue. Okay, strength and durability. We find what are called elastic tissues as well, or elastic fibers as well within the connective tissue. Elastic fibers provide what it sounds like, a little bit of flexibility or elasticity. And then reticular fibers, more strands of protein that provide more strength and durability, similar to collagen fibers. They're a little more flexible than collagen, but not as flexible as elastic. So they're somewhere in between, they're in the middle. So we generally connect, we uh, classify connective tissue as being either areolar, adipose, or reticular. And if it's reticular connective tissue, um, adipose, areolar, we see the fibers are, are kind of loosely floating around or suspended in the meat. So they call it loose connective tissue. So generally connective tissue is either loose or dense. And that's just dependent on fiber arrangement and fiber amount, really. If it's loose connective tissue, fiber amounts, those, those uh, collagen, elastic, reticular fibers, you know, they've, they've got a little bit of room. When we see dense connective tissue, we see a lot of fibers. Okay. So again, connective tissue is either loose or dense. So a lot more straightforward maybe than epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue had all kinds of classifications we just looked through. Simple squamous, stratified squamous, simple uh, cuboidal, etc. This it's either it's based on fibers. Okay. Classification of epithelium is based on cells. Cell structures, cell numbers, 
connective tissue classification is based on fibers. Exciting stuff. Maybe. All right, so you have with that dense fibrous connective tissue, we have regular or irregular. So we'll, that has to do with the arrangement. The arrangement of the fibers, dense, regular, means the fiber arrangement, first of all, because it's dense, you have a lot of them. Second of all, because it's regular, it means they're organized in a regular fashion. They're parallel with one another. So dense, regular connective tissue is oftentimes seen with tendons and ligaments. All right, so tendons and ligaments, uh, cartilage is considered to be connective tissue. By the way, tendons connect uh, or bring a muscle together to a bone. So muscles and bones are intrinsically linked with one another. They're not separate. The tissue that surrounds a bone is called periosteum. And that, in essence, becomes a tendon. And that tendon it becomes a muscle. Okay, so muscles are linked to bones via tendons. And then, so they provide movement. Ligaments provide support, usually in a lateral or medial movement. So we see ligaments providing uh, that support from a bone to a bone. So joint support. A joint is a bone coming together with another bone. So ligaments are going to be found around joints. Okay. Ligaments. When we have a sprain of some sort in the clinic, a sprain with a P, that's ligament, typically. You could have some tendons get sprained, but typically it's we strain muscles and sprain ligaments. So if an ankle gets a little bit over inverted, some of those ligaments on the lateral aspect of that malleolus or that ankle bone, they get a little bit overstretched. They might detach even. Okay. So tendons and ligaments are dense connective tissue. Bones. Believe it or not, the skeletal system and the bones that make up the skeletal system are considered connective tissue. Cells in a matrix. That's, ba that's your most basic definition of connective tissue, cells in a matrix. So we, when we look at, at bone cells under the microscope, we see that they're not piled on top of one another. They are fairly densely compacted, but we do see a matrix in bone tissue. Cartilage, we'll look at different types of cartilage. Coming up, we'll have three different cartilage types. Okay. And then blood is considered to be a connective tissue, oddly enough. I think of blood as a liquid, but it's about half liquid. 55% plasma and 45% cellular. So plasma is the matrix of the blood tissue. Cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, those are the cells that are in the matrix. We see the same thing with lymph. Okay, lymph. Lymph is a flu lymph is is primarily plasma. It's gonna have some other goodies in it, electrolytes and white blood cells, what are called lymphocytes. So when we talk about liquid, this is kind of a side note, uh, in the body, like you know, blood, we think of blood as a liquid, but again, 55% of your blood is plasma, the liquid portion. So that plasma, can be pulled out of the bloodstream. When it's pulled out of the bloodstream, it's gonna be 
in what they call the interstitial space, or it's going to be in the space that's outside of the cells. We also call it extracellular space. So plasma can be what we call an interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid. Because plasma is where, remember we did our little chemistry stuff last week. We didn't do much, but we talked a little bit about carbs, proteins, and fats, right? Glucose, amino acids, fatty acids. Those are the byproducts or the, or the building blocks of those macromolecules, that's what's being carried in the plasma. Vitamins and minerals, those are being carried in the plasma. Well, that's great, but remember, ultimately, we need to feed the cells of the body. Okay? So all of this plasma inside our bloodstream is going to ultimately be delivering those nutrients out of the bloodstream and to the cells but there's an intermediate spot that's the interstitial area that's what they call the extracellular fluid as well and remember too it's only a capillary network where we can even get plasma out of the bloodstream and into the interstitial space so as we go along and we hear all these terms Ultimately, they kind of just boil down, boil back to just one or two things. Interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid, it's the same plasma that's no longer in the bloodstream. It's all the same thing. Unfiltered lymph, they'll even call it. Because the other thing we do with plasma is we filter it because it can be kind of dirty. It can have things in it that we don't really want, maybe from our respiratory system. Or some of those additives and preservatives that we swallow with our food and drinks. Or they go into the bloodstream, but the cells don't know what to do with it. Cells are programmed to handle carbs, proteins, and fats. And certainly electrolytes. They're not there to handle a lot of what you see on your ingredient labels. So we rely on other cells to kind of filter that gunk out. And one of those types of cells are called lymphatic cells or lymph nodes. You have over 600 lymph nodes in the body that are responsible for the filtration of plasma. Kidneys also filter your plasma. Your liver also filters your plasma. Your spleen, a little bit, will filter your plasma. You've got a lot of plasma getting filtered. And the more you overwork those filters by introducing a lot of unusable material into your bloodstream, well, the more inflammatory conditions you're going to see, the more illness and disease you're going to see. So understanding plasma and extracellular fluid slash interstitial fluid and ultimately cytosol, the fluid of a cell inside that cytoplasm, plasm. So it's plasma in my blood, and then it's extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid, and then ultimately, right, through those channels and pores, we get it into the cells, and it becomes cytosol or part of that cytoplasm. So blood plasma and cytoplasm are intrinsically linked. That's how we're getting all these nutrients. It's also how we're getting the waste out of the cells too and back into the bloodstream. So these lymph nodes and this lymph fluid is in essence plasma or cytoplasm or interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid. All the same stuff, just depends on where it is and what we're doing with it. So we can take plasma out of the blood and put it into the lymphatic system. In fact, we'll see the capillary networks where we pull things out of the bloodstream are also infiltrated by lymph capillaries. So as 
plasma is leaving the bloodstream through the capillaries is getting picked up. A lot of it gets picked up by lymphatic capillaries, which then take it one direction toward a lymph node, which is, is kind of like a little tiny kidney almost. And the lymph node filters that plasma and then pumps it back up to a couple of your ducts. And then it, that filtered plasma, which is lymph when it's in the lymphatic system, gets dumped back into the bloodstream right around the superior vena cava toward the right side of the heart. So the lymphatic system is intrinsically linked with the blood system. It has a whole bunch to do with basically keeping your plasma clean from all the gunk that we expose it to. That includes airborne pathogens. Plasma has, uh, or lymph has some specialized immune system cells. All right, so anyway, connective tissue proper. So th those are some of your dense, oops. Okay, so we looked at, at some dense connective tissue. We'll look at it in a little more detail coming up. And then we have loose connective tissue. Characterized again by loosely arranged fibers and abundant ground substance. And again, the ground substance is, is, the, is the fluid, uh, the plasma of the connective tissue. So we see areolar, loose areolar, we would find in the dermis of the skin. Adipose, we find uh, in the subcutaneous or hypodermic regions of the skin. Adipose is a fancy word for fat tissue. Adipose tissue. And then reticular tissue, uh, we're oftentimes going to see that uh, where we deal with a lot of red blood cell activity. So the spleen is going to be a hotbed for uh, red blood cell storage. It's a reservoir for red blood cells and white blood cells as well. But we'll see uh, some of those reticular fibers uh, associated with the spleen. So when we look at areolar, we'll look at areolar first. So we're looking at the papillary dermis. Now what that means is um, it's the most superior superficial aspect of the, it's basically where the dermis connects to the epidermis. So it's, there's going to be quite a bit of, of activity there, but we could see when we look at this tissue sample, first of all, is it epithelium, connective, muscle, nerve? So which of the four basic tissues is it? Well, uh, you know that already because we're talking about connective tissue. But if we're just if I just gave you this, you you don't see cells densely packed on top of one another. You see a lot of negative space. Remember, the purples are going to be indicative of nuclei, chromatids. Chroma means color. It's part of where we the the olden days when they got the naming all of this stuff. The, they were using uh, dyes to see what, or, you know, to see under the microscope, and they found that the some feature of these circles, of this dye that they were putting in, and ultimately they figured out they were they were chromosome. Chromo means color. So anyway, these are colors. These darker purple stains are indicative of nuclei, DNA, chromosome. Okay. So again, we see a lot of negative space between all these purple blobs. So that tells, and we, then we can see kind of strands and, and strings in there. That tells us we have fibers. So right away, we know this is not epithelial tissue. Okay. Cells in a matrix. That looks like what we have here. We have a, an assortment of fibers kind of blended in. And again, the fibers are not very densely compacted. There's a lot of, of again, what we call that, that uh, ground substance 
kind of the, the fluid aspects contained where, where these fibers are suspended and these cells are suspended. Okay, so this is areolar tissue of the dermis. Okay. So the other, so that's your loose. We already looked a little bit at dense connective tissue, but again, dense means we have a lot of fibers. So looking at this previous image or this slide, we would see that yeah, we we have quite a few fibers, but we have a lot of cells floating around. They're not nothing's really organized or arranged. It's kind of messy. Okay. With dense connective tissue, you're not going to see much in the way of nuclei. You're going to see primarily just a ton of fibers. Okay. So dense regular just means that uh, the fibers are parallel. They're nice and organized and arranged. Okay. So we see tendons, ligaments, different types of sheaths, what are called retinaculum that we'll look at later. I mean, some of the the uh, the dermis in some areas of the body we'll see is more dense, irregular than maybe areolar. So we see dense, regular connective tissue, and we can tell again we've got all we don't have a lot in the way of nuclei, just a few nuclei. So not a lot in the way of cells but a lot in the way of strings. You can see just a ton of fibers and they're all parallel arranged. They're nice and neatly arranged uh, in, in a nice, uh, what we call regular fashion. So this is dense, regular connective tissue. This would be a tendon or a ligament. And then the special types of connective tissue, and we'll see this in more detail next week, we get into the skeletal system uh, next Tuesday. So again, we'll circle back and see uh, some of these uh, bony tissues, but you, but you kind of an introduction to it. So next week, we're gonna see this again uh, in a little bit more detail, but we can see what they've done. They have a bone here. They took a small chunk of it. They blew it up over here. So what we have on top, kind of the covering of the bone is called peri, which means around, and then osteum, which has to do with the bone. So we have periosteum. And then we'll see some different types of canals, of blood supply. So they call this compact bone. And again, we'll see this in more detail next week, but compact bone and then spongy bone. Uh, deep to that compact bone. And now what they've done is they've taken a chunk of compact bone and kind of blown it up for you. They took a chunk of spongy bone and blew it up for you. But again, we can see uh, little tiny cells are called osteocytes. You can see a little kind of a blue blob there, surrounded by yellow. Put another one there. Hey, these are osteocytes. You can see them over here as well. And then this, uh, this all this other kind of negative space here, this is the matrix. It's a bony or ossified matrix comprised primarily of calcium and phosphorus. Okay, so this matrix is primarily calcium and phosphorus. And again, we've got cells in a matrix. And they show a couple different types of cells over here, osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Again, we'll see these in more detail next week. Blasts are bone builders, so they're laying down bone, and clasts are bone chiselers. They're modeling the bone or kind of chiseling it. So bone tissue is connective tissue. We have cartilage. We're gonna see three types of cartilage. 
hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibro cartilage. And generally in that order, uh, we're going from least fibrous to most fibrous. So hyaline cartilage doesn't really have a heck of a lot uh, of, of, uh, of fibers within it, collagen fibers. So we wouldn't see a lot of strength generally with hyaline cartilage. It's gonna be there more for, uh, to provide some flexibility. So the nose is hyaline cartilage. The parts of the vocal folds and the trachea are gonna be hyaline cartilage. They, the rings, they call them cartilaginous rings around the trachea specifically are gonna be hyaline cartilage. Your bony skeleton when you're in the womb is made of cartilage. And eventually, you know, that cartilage ossifies. It, it's ossifying while we're in the womb. It's part of some of the, the communication between the fetus and the mother uh, is going on regarding uh, ossification mechanisms. As babies starting to ossify, mom is getting the message that uh, we need to release some oxytocin and some other hormones that'll start the process of uterine contraction and ultimately childbirth. Okay, cartilage. Cartilage is, is uh, generally considered to be avascular as well, so no blood supply. Elastic cartilage is next. So this is going to have fibers, but they're going to be primarily elastic fibers. Let's see the ears, what's called the epiglottis. That's the little flap that closes your trachea off from your, basically it closes the respiratory tract off from the digestive tract when you swallow food or beverages. But yeah, fibrocartilage is next. We'd find that. Uh, primarily between the vertebrae. We call these the intervertebral discs. We also find it at what they call the pubic symphysis. That's where the pubis bones meet in the front. There's a little brick of it right there. The pubic symphysis. This is fibrocartilage, and then all of those intervertebral discs are fibrocartilage. So they're gonna provide a little bit more in the way of strength and durability. And again, we're still in connective tissue. We're cruising along, almost done with connective tissue. Okay, hyaline cartilage, which again, the nose and the, think of like the sternum and the ribs. And they call it a milk glass appearance. Unless you're an antique dealer or buyer, you probably wouldn't know what milk glass is. But anyway, it's kind of got an opalescent uh, look to it. Kind of pretty under the microscope. And again, next week when we get into bones, we'll see uh, more skeletal uh, and cartilaginous tissue. Connective tissue. All right, almost done with connective tissue. Lastly, uh, blood. Again, we spend a whole week talking about blood uh, and if it, as well as the immune system. But here shows if we separate blood, we get 55% uh, of it plasma, and the other 45% is what we call cellular. Okay, so cells in a matrix. The three types of cells are red blood cells white blood cells and platelets. And as you can see by this test tube, red blood cells are the most abundant of the cellular uh, aspects. And again, we spend a whole bunch of time on blood, so I don't wanna get too much going there. Same with this system, we spend quite a bit of time on each of these, so I'll go through this one relatively quickly. So first tissue type, epithelium, second tissue type, connective, and then deep to all of that connective tissue, we're gonna find what's called muscle tissue. 
muscle tissue is again either skeletal muscle, meaning that the muscles are attached to the bones of the body, and they provide the, and are there to provide some sort of movement. Smooth muscle, those are again all of those tracks and tubes of the body are going to be smooth muscle. And then lastly, cardiac muscle, of course, dealing with the heart. Specifically and primarily, you know, when we get to the cardiovascular system, we're going to dissect uh, hearts and you're going to see that uh, the ventricles of the lower chambers of the heart, those are going to be much more, uh, they look a lot like skeletal muscle, They're very striated, very strong, very solid. They're the ventricles and they call it cardiac muscle because those it looks, again, it has a lot of striations, looks a lot like skeletal, but it's going to have some specialized discs called intercalated discs that we'll see. Uh, but a heart, especially the ventricles, looks a lot like if we took a tubular skeletal muscle and just kind of formed it into a ball. They, they look a lot alike. Okay. Now, the atria or the, the sup, uh, superior chambers, those are the what we call the receiving chambers of the heart. They're more like bladders because they're just, they're like filling up with blood and then there's a trap door and the blood just kind of dumps out of them into the ventricles. The ventricles have to do all of the contraction. So when we eject blood out of the heart, it's the ventricles that do it. So they look a lot more like skeletal muscle, whereas we'll see the atria have a little bit more of a smooth muscle appearance. Not, as, not really much in the way of striations. Again, like your urinary bladder is smooth muscle. Uh, your stomach is smooth muscle. So we classify muscle beyond just these three, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. We also discuss them based on uh, whether they have what I mentioned a few minutes ago, striations or stripes, and whether uh, they are voluntarily moved or involuntarily moved. Well, Voluntary movement only occurs with one of those, and that's skeletal muscle. Right? We have voluntary control of our skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle, so you know your digestive tract. So when you chew food, you're using skeletal muscles, but as soon as you swallow that food, you're now relying on smooth muscles, uh, tubes, to involuntarily move that food all the way through 25 to 30 feet of tube uh, till it leaves uh, the body out to the toilet. Smooth muscle goes through what we call peristalsis or peristalsis, but that's like a rhythmic squeezing motion. It's like if you have a tube and you put something at one end of the tube and you want to get it to the other end of the tube, you just keep squeezing from behind, right? Whenever you knock it, it behind it and eventually it's going to come out the other end. So that squeezing or rhythmic squeezing is called peristalsis. Okay, and then cardiac muscle again, that, that's its own, uh, that's involuntary. Okay. But cardiac and skeletal are both going to have striations or stripes, whereas smooth muscle does not. Smooth muscle, no stripes. So you can see a smooth muscle cell here, skeletal muscle cell. And by the way, a skeletal muscle cell is called a muscle fiber. They're multinucleated. So you can see a muscle fiber here, multiple nuclei around it. Again, we'll get to that here shortly in a couple weeks, I believe. So that's it for, for muscle tissue. Lastly, we have nervous tissue. Okay, so epithelial, connective, muscle, and now nervous. And nervous tissue, again, is all over the place. It goes through. Uh, it's in all of your muscles. It's in all of your uh, connective tissue for the most part. We do have a few spots like cartilage where we don't really find much in the way of a nerve supply. But the nervous system is made up entirely of nervous tissue. What's nervous tissue made of? Nervous cells, right? What are the nerve cells? We just had two, a neuron and nerve glue, neuroglia. So this one we saved for last because it has the least bells and whistles. <laughs> 
So the neuron is one of the two primary cells that make up nervous tissue. So like muscle fiber is a muscle cell. Neuron is a nerve cell. We'll see osteocyte is a bone cell. So anyway, neurons. We see neuron again. I'm not going to spend much time on this because we spend plenty of time on the nervous system coming up here in a couple of weeks. But this is your introduction to it. We see a neuron is going to have what we call a cell body. That's where the nucleus is going to be stored. And then we have what are called dendrites. Dendrites are finger-like projections. And most neurons are going to have multiple dendrites. And then lastly, we have uh, what we call the axon. And all neurons just have one axon. And the axon terminals are going to plug into the dendrites of a neighboring neuron. So what's connected to this dendritic end here is an axon terminal of another neuron. So these are just basically wires that connect to one another and transmit signals. And now all like this myelin sheath, for instance, this would be composed of neuroglia, glial cells. Myelin is one of the ingredients of glial cells. They're called Schwann's cells or Schwann cells, like the Schwann's man delivering ice cream to your house. Schwann cells are glial cells that secrete myelin. In the spinal cord and brain, we have different types of glial cells secreting different types of chemicals, usually insulations. Tissue repair and scarring. You guys can view that or look at that on your own. All right. Uh, let's see. Tegumentary. I, not a heck of a lot with this. I want to go through a few things and then we'll be done. You guys need a break first? Okay. No? Keep her moving? All right, I'll keep her moving. Integumentary, I've already discussed some of it. Right? We've talked a little bit about epithelial tissue, and we've talked about connective tissue. And while we did, we mentioned the epidermis. So we're going to start with uh, that aspect. Now the skin, the hair, and the nails, those are all part of the integumentary system. All right, skin layers. This is where we want to focus our energy a little bit. Uh, the epidermis is going to be uh, the epithelium. It's going to therefore be the covering of the skin. And you can see, whoops, you can see the epidermis. Blow it up. You can see it's the, this top layer. You can also see it's kind of bumpy at the end. That's that basement layer that where it connects with uh, uh, the underlying dermis. One thing we also see, let me undo that, uh, as we look at the epidermis, we can see again all of these little circles indicative of nuclei of cells. And so we have densely compacted cells that again tells us that we're dealing with epithelium. Now, a couple of other features, we can see a pore kind of passing through the epidermis, and again, that pore is not associated at all with the epidermis. It's down in the dermis where that pore uh, or where, you know, whatever that gland is, uh, this is gonna be a sweat gland, and then it has its tube that has to exit the body. So that, that tube just happens to puncture through uh, the epidermis. We also see all of this yellow, and by the way, when, we, when we're looking at organs and organ tissues throughout the semester, especially these illustrations, color is a big deal. Now, red is always going to be indicative of oxygenated blood. Okay? Red is generally going to be uh, 
oxygen, nutritive. Okay. Blue is going to be uh, carbon dioxide or low oxygen blood. Typically, then, we would say red vessels are going to be arteries or arterioles, and blue vessels are going to be veins or venules. And then yellow is always indicative of fat. So we can see some kind of yellow over here, quite a bit of yellow here. We can see some yellow at the bottom as well. Okay. So yellow is indicative of fat. Now, nerves are surrounded with myelin, and myelin is primarily lipid or fat. So nerves are also represented as yellow. So all of these little buggers here are going to be nerves. And then these are different types of nerve endings. So these circles, they might help with pressure, like, like the sense of pressure. If we put pressure out here on the skin, it goes down and, and involves these little corpuscles. And then we have these other little nerve endings that plug into that basement membrane of the epidermis. And those are going to help maybe with the pressure as well, but maybe, uh, maybe some tactile uh, aspects. And then we might have some temperature or um, pain receptors as well. But anyway, you can see we've got nerves and nerve endings kind of scattered all over the place. And then this is kind of a yellowish white that's going to be sweat gland. And then this we have what's called an oil gland or a sebaceous gland. Sebaceous glands are almost always going to be found with hair follicles. So hair follicles have to be kept somewhat hydrated. And so that's your dermis aspect. So again, epidermis and then the dermis. And then the hypodermis is this deep uh, subcutaneous fat layer. You notice all this blood supply. We've got the bulb of the hair follicle being fed with uh, blood. We've got a few nerves plugging into that hair follicle. And then we also have a muscle, our first muscle of the semester called the erector pili muscle. This is gonna be what uh, enables a hair to stand up on end. This also has to do with goosebumps. And so temperature regulation stuff. When we look at the epidermis, there are several different layers um, we're going to focus primarily on four layers. There's a fifth one that appears in some of your thicker skin, like on the palms of the hands or the soles of the feet. But 90% of your skin probably is going to, you know, 80%, 90% is going to be thin skin and it's going to have these four layers. The first layer is the deepest layer, it's the basement. We call it the basal stratum basal so that just means base layer or the basement layer this is also known as the germinating layer okay the germinating layer so cell division and mitosis is going on down in the basement okay stratum basal the lifespan of one of these newborn baby uh, cells, skin cells, is going to be about a month, maybe five weeks, four to five weeks. So from basement to top or corneum, we'd say it's about uh, 28 to 35 days. So every 28 to 35 days or so, you've got a whole new batch of epidermis. In fact, most of the dust and dander in your house and your vacuum cleaner is probably skin. Yeah, dead epidermis. If you have pets, it's even more so. All right, so that's the basal layer. Spinosum is next. The spinosal layer lies just over top or just superficial to that basal or germinating layer. The spinosal layer is going to have cells that specialize in kind of keeping an eye on cell division. It, the, the spinosal layer spies on the basal layer and makes sure, in essence, that uh, cell division is not occurring too rapidly uh, or is occurring uh, not rapidly enough. So basically, spinosum helps a lot with uh, 
uh, ensuring that cell division is taking place. Now, and, and at the right speed. The other thing that we see regarding these cells of the epidermis, this is the whole epidermis. Most of them, I'd say 90%, maybe higher of the cells are what we call keratin cells. So we'll look at that coming up here in a few minutes as well. But keratin, K-E-R-A-T-I-N, keratin. Oh, you can see it says right here, keratinocytes. Keratinocytes. Remember, site means cell. So keratinocytes, cells that produce keratin. So the bulk of cells of the epidermis are keratinocytes. Again, probably 90% or so. Uh, another 8%, so less than 10%, are going to be what we call melanocytes. So we'll see that coming up as well in just a few minutes. Melanocytes produce melanin. M-E-L-A-N-I-N. -N. Melanin. Melanin is pigment. So about 8% of all your epidermal cells are going to be pigment cells or melanocytes. And then the other two make up less than 1% of your epidermis. We'll talk about those. Uh, we'll touch on those in just a few minutes. All right, granular layer. This is kind of the waterproofing layer, the granulosum. So it has specialized granules in the cells, in the cytoplasm of the cell, that enable uh, waterproofing to occur. You know, you can walk outside in the rain or take a shower or a bath or swim in your pool and you're not taking on all that water, partly in part because of this granular layer. And then lastly, the most superficial layer is called the stratum corneum, the corneal layer. At this point, the cells that originated down here in the basement, they pretty much dehydrated and have sloughed off. They're, they're, they're just densely compacted, flat cells of dead skin. We say the skin has become keratinized at that point, keratinized. The cervix and the vaginal canal uh, of the female are very similar to the epidermis. Uh, the difference is there's more mucosal aspects. You're gonna have more goblet cells, but when they do a pap smear, they're basically taking a cervical tissue sample to, to make sure that the this, this, uh, epithelium hasn't become keratinized. So there are keratinocytes of the cervix and they shouldn't be hardened or keratinized. So that's what, uh, and if they have been or there are signs of keratinization of cervical cells, that could be indicative of cervical cancer. So that's one of the preventatives. So a pap smear is like a preventative for uh, cervical, not a preventative, I guess sort of preventative. It's an early detection, right? Like a mammogram maybe, or a prostate exam for males. Okay, so anyhow, uh, keratinocytes. These are all these, but so this is the basement membrane here. So underneath is going to be the connective tissue of the dermis. And so all of this is going to be epidermis. And then you can see the corneal layer of the cells have lost all of their nuclei. They're all just flat. Kind of dehydrated at that point. There's a third or a, a fifth layer that comes between the granular layer and the corneal layer we find in thick skin called the stratum lucidum. Lucid means transparent, in essence. So it's kind of a transparent layer. So these are those primary sites that we see uh, of the skin. And, and this particularly, the epidermis, we see the keratinocytes making up the bulk 
90% or so of the epidermis. The melanocytes, maybe around 8%. Uh, and they, they're near the basal uh, layer, near that basement membrane. Melanocytes basically are kind of like filtering ultraviolet rays. So the more ultraviolet rays uh, exposure, the more active the melanocytes are. And then we have longer Han cells. They help with uh, some of the immune aspects. And we might have a few fibroblasts embedded in there too, helping with some collagen. Fibro means fibers. Blast means build. So these are fiber building cells. Maybe give a little bit of collagen in the, in the epidermis as well, providing some strength. And then Merkel cells, are gonna be down in the basement and they're connected with those nerve endings. So Merkel cells help uh, with some of the nervous system sensory uh, that is going on. Just more of the same going through melanocytes, keratinocytes, melanocytes, Langerhan cells. All right, so the dermal layer, again, that's where all of the action is. That's where we're going to see blood supply, nerve supply, uh, the, the origination of sweat glands, oil glands, hair follicles, pressure receptors, the whole nerve network. We've got a couple of terms. The sebaceous means oil. You know, these are sebaceous or oil glands. And then sweat glands are sudoriferous. So the papillary region is where we, papilla means bump. So wherever we see little bumps, that's going to be the papillary region. So that's the most superficial region of the dermis. And it's where it attaches to the basement of the epidermis. So then the rest of the dermis is called the particular region. And we have all these little Meisner's corpuscles. These are touch receptors, the tactile receptors. And Oil glands attached with the hair follicles, keeps the hair follicles from being too rigid or dried out or dehydrated. And then of course, sweat glands or sudoriferous glands. And then the hair follicles. Okay, so we look at this slide and we're like, what the heck is this? Well, again, we've got a bunch of cells. We see all kinds of blue circles and blue dots are kind of smashed together here. And then we see uh, more of the same kind of flattened. So we're looking at epidermis here. And then we've got some connective tissue, epidermis kind of pumping through here. These are the papules. These are those little bumps. So this is where the, the basement of the, and again, notice when we dye cells, wherever there's a lot of nucleated cells, we're going to see heavy, heavy, deep purple. So this is indicative of just a ton of cells. So my point is epithelium is always going to die extremely purple because of all the cells compacted. Whereas connective tissue has cells that are more scattered around so we're not gonna we're gonna see purple but it's gonna be more scattered so anyway just fyi and again thick skin versus thin skin we have that stratum lucidum that's going to be one of the primary differences and again thick Thick skin, we're thinking, you know, again, palms of the hands, soles of the feet. 
certainly a lot thicker superior layers for thick skin. That's why they call it thick skin. Sebaceous or oil glands, we looked at those. Sweat glands, we've already seen as well. Um, dermal circulation, again, blood, one of the primary functions of the integumentary system is not just protection, but it's thermal regulation. So these sweat glands and these pores are extremely important for temperature regulation. Blood vessels, uh, these capillaries that are embedded throughout the dermis uh, provide some warmth, certainly, so we can uh, warm the skin. Uh, and again, we can cool the skin by vasoconstricting or moving blood away from the skin. Um, anyway. Dermal circulation, uh, vitamin D synthesis. These are more physiology things. This is what we do in advanced is go through some of these. But the other thing that, that we do is uh, we store vitamin D uh, in the liver. We store vitamin D in subcutaneous fat cells. Okay. We store vitamin D in a few other spots in the body. But uh, in order to get calcium to absorb, in the small intestine. So everything you consume gets absorbed in the intestine. Calcium needs a little extra help for absorption, and that has to do with vitamin D. So if you're lacking vitamin D and you take a ton of calcium, you may not, it may not matter. You may not absorb it. You may just poop out the calcium. You're not going to absorb it because you might be lacking in vitamin D. And vitamin D is fat soluble. So you store what you don't use. It's going to be stored again in your fat, under your skin, as well as in the liver. Now, vitamin D can only get activated in its stored state if you are exposed to ultraviolet radiation. So UV rays coming through and being filtered by those uh, melanocytes in the skin ultimately are going to trigger or activate stored vitamin D. And that stored vitamin D will then trigger some chemical reactions of the liver that ultimately enable you to absorb calcium. It's a lot of rigmarole to get calcium and you need a lot of calcium. I know you have a lot in your bones, but calcium is going to provide your muscle movements with the ability to contract. You have a ton of calcium stored in your muscle fibers as well. And your muscles need calcium continually in order to function. So vitamin D uh, synthesis relies on UV radiation, ultraviolet radiation. And again, the innervation aspect, we will, we, talked a little bit about primarily uh, dealing with, again, the peripheral nervous system. And then lastly, we talked or look at what are called dermatomes. And, you know, the, the vertebral column and the spinal cord, the vertebral column uh, surrounds or protects the spinal cord. Well, in between each vertebra, we're going to see what are called spinal nerves that come off of those vertebrae. And spinal nerves are either delivering some sort of motor signal out to the muscles, or they're receiving sensory information from, you know, from somewhere else. So dermatomes show us on the skin if we have issues with sensation in a certain area of the skin, it could be related to a problem with, uh, with uh, the spinal cord and the vertebral column. So, so in essence, what they're saying is all of the innervation of the arms down to the fingertips, all of those nerves are coming off of the upper cervical and maybe the, around the first thoracic pair of spinal nerves. But yeah, if you've got a patient that ex is exhibiting shoulder, elbow, finger, wrist issues regarding sensation, body temperature, pain, whatever it might be, 
Their issue is certainly could be localized and be a soft tissue problem, but we also can't uh, rule out there being an issue all the way up here where the nerves that supply that area uh, come from. And those nerves that supply the arms and the shoulders all come out of the neck. So if someone has had whiplash or someone has had some sort of just chronic neck issues or maybe a, any type of neck issues, it could lead to uh, some sort of problem with sensation uh, or even motor movement uh, and certainly pain in the upper appendages or the arms. Okay. Uh, same with the legs. We see, you know, depending on where the, the issue might be with the patient, uh, oftentimes patients will come in and they'll talk about uh, tingling or numbness or some sort of sensation uh, or pain, whatever, in the back of the leg, kind of radiates down the back of their legs, down into their, their calf muscles. Well, oftentimes that's going to be like a sciatic nerve issue or something going on with the extreme low back and there are those nerves come off. If they've got issues more on the front of the thighs and down into the knees, it, we could be a little higher up more in the lumbar region, could be some sort of a herniated disc or uh, impingement going on that way. So anyway, derma means skin. So dermatomes are just areas on the skin where a lot of physicians will carry, it looks like a little metal, almost like a pinwheel. And they'll run that pinwheel along certain areas of your skin to see if you have sensation. And if you don't have sensation on a certain dermatome, it could be indicative of a problem all the way up in the neck. So anyhow, that's the, that's the gist of that. All right, I think I am just about done for the day. I'm gonna talk about hair or nails. You guys can do that on your own. And the tissue repair, we already looked at a little bit. And that's it, that takes us into next week. So next week, again, I'm not gonna do a heck of a lot with bone. So between now and next Tuesday, certainly you wanna be finishing up your, your unit one, two, and three, or your module one stuff, uh, your first assignment, you know, you wanna be continuing to work on that, doing your identifications. But uh, if you, once you get all of that done, if you're looking ahead to week, or to week, I guess it'd be week four, next week, we're gonna start it on the skeletal system. So you can certainly look at some of it in the visible body, um, I'm not going to do a heck of a lot with it. Um, I will be, hand, you, well, you will be, but uh, we will all be kind of handling the bones and you'll be looking at uh, different bone uh, structures and bony features. And so anyhow, that's the, that's what's on tap for next time. And of course, your visible body quizzes. You can You're welcome. <laughs>